Good evening. We're going to begin with the hymn number 103, please. Hymn number 103. Conveniently enough tonight, we're actually singing 103, 104 and 105 as we go forward our three hymns tonight. But hymn number 103. Have you read the story of the cross where Jesus bled and died when your debt was paid by the precious blood? that flowed from his wounded side. We'll stand as we sing hymn number 103, please. Let's stand together.
Amen. Now let's seek the Lord's face together in a word of prayer, please. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank Thee for the words that we have just been singing, the words on our lips. He died an atoning death for Thee. And Lord, we thank Thee for all that Christ has done. We praise Thee for Calvary. We thank Thee for what He accomplished upon the middle tree. We thank Thee that the blood was shed. And we thank Thee that atonement was made for the souls of His people. And Lord, we know we do not deserve anything from Thine hand. We know, if anything, we deserve hell and wrath and judgment. We deserve the utmost of Thine anger. But Lord, we praise Thee that instead of giving unto us Thy wrath, rather it pleased the Lord to bruise Him, that it's placed Thy wrath upon Christ. We thank Thee in eternity past that a plan was made a decree was forthcoming in knowing that a Savior was provided for a people that are not worthy of Him. Lord, the Scriptures even tell us in, in John that He came unto His own and His own received Him not. When we think of the foolishness of man, that when the very Messiah was stood before them, when the very King of glory was preaching, yet still there was a rejection in the heart of man. And still we read in the Scriptures that instead of destroying us as is thine divine prerogative, instead of sending for angels to cause great wrath and judgment to fall upon us, instead of condemning, him, condemning us in a moment because of our rebellion, we thank thee that all that we received was love and mercy and grace and tenderness. And Lord, we must... We must be honest before Thee tonight that if we were in a similar position, we would not show the love which God showed unto us. We would not show grace like Thou hast shown grace. We would not show compassion as Thou did show compassion. But we praise Thee for it all. And even though we don't deserve it, we thank Thee and we love Thee. And we thank Thee tonight, even in that, that we love Thee because Thou hast first loved us. And Father, as we bring our praises unto Thee tonight, we know, we do know that we will fall short. But Lord, help us to give our utmost in the singing of Thy praises. Help us even in the place of prayer to realize corporately, collectively, we have stood not just in Money Slain Free Presbyterian Church, but, but we're standing before the very throne of God in this moment in the place of prayer. Help us to realize as we read thy scriptures that we are not just reading a book and we certainly are not reading fiction or the work of men's hands, but we are reading the very words of very God. Oh, Father, help us as we preach the word. We pray that there may be a word in season to every soul. Lord, thou knowest every head that is bowed. Thou knowest every eye that is closed before thee now. Thou knowest the heart's condition. Lord, Thou knowest those that are Thine. Thou knowest those that are endeavoring to walk with God, to go on with Thee, to live a holier life. Lord, encourage them tonight. Build them up in their most holy faith. Revive the souls of Thy people. We pray for those that are maybe here tonight and, and they know they're not walking with Thee. They know they're in a backslidden condition. They know that they were saved at one time. they they believe it was a true and honest profession before thee, but, but right now they know they are not living the Christian life as they ought to be. Lord, we pray that they may repent and find thee afresh tonight. And Father, we ask for those that are not saved, and they know, they know they're not saved. Maybe they've been to church all their lives. Maybe they own a Bible. Maybe they know their way around the Bible, and they know the the. The, the hymns, and they sing them with gusto, and they, they know everything there is to know about church life. And yet no Christ for them. Oh, Father, save them tonight. Save them in this very meeting house. And we do plead with Thee that a great moving and a great stirring of Thy Spirit may come down. Lord, Thou art the one that can send the floods upon the dry ground. Thou art the one that can open the windows of heaven. 
and pour out a blessing upon us where there's not room enough to receive it. Oh God, thou art the only one that can breathe upon us and breathe reviving life into the souls of thy people. And we pray that even tonight it would be so and that Christ would be glorified and Christ would be exalted through everything we do in this meeting house tonight. But undertake for the need. And we do pray that as we leave this place a little later on, we'll be able to say it was good to be here. It was good to be here. Why? For we, we met with Christ. We did business with the King. We were in the King's presence. Oh God, undertake for the need we ask and help us to do everything with a full heart of praise unto Thee. We ask these things in the Saviour's worthy and most precious name. Amen. Hymn number 304, please. 304, the greatest question we can ever answer. What can wash away my sin? And look at the answer. Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Of Jesus. Let's sing it out, hymn number 104, please. Let's stand together. My pardon this my plea, nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, a turning in God's word.
tonight, please, to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. And we're going to read the entirety of this chapter together, only 15 verses. But a wonderful chapter, a chapter of prophecy. We'll look at this in a moment or two, but Isaiah is prophesying of a time when the Jewish people were in the Babylonian captivity and when they were going to have that time come to an end and when they were going to depart from Babylon and head back to Jerusalem. But also it's a wonderful picture of the church and all that is done in Christ and the, the, the release we have from the captivity of sin and the freedom we're given in Christ. But Isaiah 52, let's begin our reading of the verse 1 together please. Isaiah 52, verse 1. The Word of God states, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there is no more come unto thee the, uncircum the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise, and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught, they that rule over them, make them to howl, saith the Lord. And my name continually, every day, is blasphemed. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with a voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart ye, depart ye. Go ye out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out to the midst of her. Be ye clean the bare the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your re reward. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, he shall be exalted and extolled, and be very high. As many were astonished at the his vis his visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men, so shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. We trust the Lord will bless the public reading of his holy and precious word to each heart tonight. Now, at this point in the service, let me bid each one a very warm welcome in the Saviour's name. We also welcome those visiting with us tonight, and we do trust that the Lord will bless us as we gather around God's Word, even at this gospel service. Please remember today, being the first Sunday of the month, is our retiring missionary offering. But then let me thank you for last Sunday's church maintenance fund offering they came to £435. We do sincerely thank you in the Saviour's name for your generosity in that regard. But please do remember next Lord's Day, 
that the Sabbath school are going to be lifting an offering for the work in Nepal. And you can also add to that in the retiring offering as you leave next Lord's Day. So please do remember that. Come prepared to support the work of God in that country. But for the week ahead of us, there's now no gospel bus on Tuesday evening, not until it recommences in May. But once again, I would encourage God's people, please pray for the boys and girls that have heard the word of God, even in the last season that has gone into eternity. There's been many memory verses learned, many choruses sung, many stories and lessons given. And the truth has gone out meeting after meeting after meeting. And then last Tuesday, all the parents and family members were in, and it was a blessed time. So please pray that there will be further fruit and a further reaping of the harvest from the gospel boss that has now finished for the winter months. But then on Wednesday, please remember the prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m. and the workers' prayer meeting on Thursday. That's always a wonderful time of blessing, so please remember that. That's also 8 p.m. on Thursday. And then on Friday, the youth fellowship at the same time of 8 p.m. will be gathering together in the church hall, and Mr. Chris Kellen will be coming to speak on the subject, what the Bible teaches about drugs. So please do remember that. Young people, then the services next Lord's Day, the Sabbath school at 10.45 in the morning, and the morning worship at 12 noon, preceded by prayer at 11.30, and then the evening gospel service at 7 p.m., preceded by prayer at 6.30. The next committee meeting, brethren, is for Tuesday, the 14th of December at 8 p.m., so please remember that any items for the agenda need to be submitted to Mr. Andrew Bell, the committee secretary, before Saturday, please. As you leave, also remember the current magazines are available for those that have subscribed to them for this time. And then let me say also that the church hall can be used as an overflow uh, for those maybe listening from the car park or even those listening online. It can be used as an overflow. You can sit in there, enjoy the meeting in the warmth, still come to the house of God, but maybe have that wee bit more space as well. So please remember that. And then also let me remind you that if there's any that have any books that they would like to donate for the new church library to speak to myself or a member of session or a member of committee, and we'll be able to sort those things out. But please continue to pray for those that have been sick, even in recent days and need a touch from the great physician, those that are shut in and would love to be out, especially in the darker nights, please remember them and also those that have been bereaved of late. Remember them all before the Lord, that the Lord would comfort them. But of course, all of these announcements are subject to the will and mind of the Lord. But we're going to sing again, please. Hymn number 105. 105. In evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear. It's a terrible thing to be found in our sin, isn't it? In evil long I took delight. But look at the next part. Till a new object met my sight and stopped my wild career. Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? Hymn number 105. Let's stand as we sing together. Let's stand together. <clears throat>
My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me. Now, turning in the Word of God together, please, back to that portion we read earlier. Isaiah chapter 52, please. Isaiah chapter 52 in our text is the verse 7. And we're looking at the subject, soul winning in all its beauty. Soul winning in all its beauty. Isaiah 52 verse 7, the word of God states, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Soul winning in all its beauty. With the word of God open before us, let's seek the Lord's face in a word of prayer together, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have our Bibles open before thee now. And Lord, we ask that not only our Bibles will be open, but that our hearts will be open also unto the preaching of thy truth. We pray whatever the condition of the heart tonight, whether it be thy people, whether it be the backslider, whether it be the unconverted, Lord, have a word in season for every soul we plead. And do a great work, we ask of thee. O God, redeem. O God, restore. O God, revive. Even tonight, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Isaiah is both a wonderful and a privileged book of the Bible. Wonderful because it tells us all about Christ. It tells us all about Christ's birth, exactly how it would be that he would be virgin born. It tells us about his life. It tells us about his death and his resurrection also. But the remarkable thing is this, that he tells us all about Christ long before Christ was even born. 800 years or so before the incarnation. But it's not only a wonderful book, but it's a, a privileged book as well. Because we read in the New Testament that it is the book that John the Baptist preached his first sermon out of. But more importantly, and far more notably, is this, that it is the first sermon that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, preached, uh, the book that the Lord Jesus Christ preached his first sermon out of. Turn with me to Luke chapter 4, if you would, and we read a little of that sermon, and it is a wonderful, wonderful account, and we find that this is a privileged book indeed, because the Lord turns to it as the first, the first portion of Scripture that He wants to expound before the people, and He turns there because it is very clear that Isaiah is speaking about Christ. It says in Luke chapter 4 and the verse 16, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Verse 17, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. That's the book of Isaiah. We find this is amazing. The Lord Jesus is, is going to preach from the book of Isaiah. And it says, And when he had Open the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And it goes on. And look at it, verse 20 then. It says, And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. You see, that's where the Lord preached his first sermon from. So it's a wonderful book, and it's a privileged book. But as we come to Isaiah chapter 52, we find something more again, that this chapter is a wonderful prophecy. And it's a prophecy concerning the glorious state of the church, especially in the last days, in the time when the Lord is going to come again, and he's going to rule and reign on earth, and we're going to reign with him. And chapter 52 is brought to us in a type, or brought to us in a picture. It's brought to us in a picture of the Jews at the time of their captivity in Babylon. It's brought to us in a time when, 
when they needed deliverance, when they were going to be there in a foreign land away from Jerusalem, away from the temple worship for 70 long years. And look what it says in the verse 1 of chapter 52. The Lord speaking through Isaiah, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Now they've been in weakness for 70 years. They've lost their homeland. Those of you that, that listen through the series in Ezra and Nehemiah, you know about this, this history, and they were in their weakness. The walls were broken down. The temple was burned with fire. They were in a foreign country. But, but it says, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. The holy city. So there's going to be a restoration of the city, and we know all about this. But then we find that that is a picture being brought to us not only of the Jews returning to Jerusalem, but it's also a picture of the church. It's a picture of you and I in our sin. It's a picture of you and I in our, in our slothfulness and in the captivity of our bondage of sin. And it's saying to the believer, the sleeping soul, the one that is dead in trespass and in sins, awake, awake, put on strength, old church. Put on strength, old Christian. And it's an exhortation to salvation. Look at the verse 3. We find that redemption from Babylon or freedom from Babylon is guaranteed here. It says in the verse 3, For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught. When we think about that, they sold themselves in their sin and the wrath of God came. But look what it says, And ye shall be redeemed without money. Isn't that a wonderful truth? You could stop there and preach a sermon on that, couldn't you? You shall be redeemed without money. Or they didn't have to pay anything. In fact, when you look through the history of the Jews leaving Babylon, actually Cyrus, he paid for everything, didn't he? He paid for everything. He pray, paid for the building of the temple. We read in Nehemiah's day how, how the heathen king paid for the rebuilding of the walls. It cost them nothing to go home, but, but far more than that. Think of our condition, the soul's condition. That we sold ourselves into sin. We sold ourselves into sin when we fell in Adam and we constantly disobeyed the law. And we didn't get us anything for ourselves in that. We, we sold ourselves in all. But look what it says in the verse 3. Applying it to our souls, ye shall be redeemed without money. You see, our salvation isn't on the basis of paying into the offering plate. Our salvation isn't based on our church attendance. Our redemption isn't based on our good works or reforming our lives or anything else. You see, it's a picture of the Jews that is to come, but it's also a picture of the believer in Christ. He shall be redeemed without money. But then what else do we see? Look at the verse 11. The verse 11. We find that now they're told to get up. You're leaving Babylon. You're going to go home to Jerusalem. You're going back to the promised land after the captivity. When the redemption comes, you're going to leave the world. And it says in the verse 11, Depart ye, depart ye. Go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out to the midst of her. Be ye clean, the bear the vessels of the Lord. Now, obviously, that is not just a reference to the Jews leaving Babylon, but it's a reference to the people of God that when you've awoken out of your sin, when you've trusted in the Lord, when you've been redeemed without money and without price, then there is a call, depart from the world, separate from the world, live unto holiness. And the verse 11 is very clear, be ye clean. And who is to be clean? Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Friend, we are the vessels of the Lord. The Holy Spirit rests and abides within us. But then come back to the verse 7 with me, please. Because here we find not only this idea of a holy separated people being, being awakened from their sin, awakened from their bondage, being redeemed and not free of charge, and then being called to separate and be holy unto the Lord. But the verse 7, look what it says now. With the same image in our minds, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. 
Now think of it in the Jewish sense, in the Babylonian history sense. You think of the time when, when men like Daniel were reading through the Scriptures, and, and we know these things, or at least I hope we do, where, where Daniel worked out from reading books like Jeremiah, he worked out that the 70 years of captivity were up, and he began to pray in the book of Daniel, if you remember. And then something happened. God stirred up the heart of Cyrus, and he said they could go away home, didn't he? You imagine the joy of the Jews as the king's ambassador proclaimed the message. He gathered the Jewish people together that had been in bondage for 70 years. And this man, no doubt, standing upon a mountain, standing in a pulpit, standing in a high place to speak to all of the Jewish people, he would have brought them the good tidings, the peace, the salvation. You're going home again. You can return to Jerusalem, but not only concerning the Jews, but concerning our souls. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Think of it in the gospel. Think of the idea here of a preacher bringing the wonderful message of Christ, bringing the message of peace, bringing the message of salvation, bringing the message that thy God reigneth. Do you remember that time, friend? Those of you that are Christians, do you remember that time? Maybe you sat in a gospel meeting, maybe you sat in a mission, and whoever was preaching, and they preached Christ unto your soul, and they warned you of your sin, and they warned you of the wrath to come, and they told you of Christ, and they told you of Calvary, and they told you of the blood, and you realized in that moment, I must get right with God. What a beautiful moment it was. Well, that's the picture before us. That's the picture before us. And there's nothing more beautiful than this idea in the verse 7 of soul winning and seeing souls won for Christ. Soul winning in all its beauty. Now, when we look at the verse 7, it's actually a prophecy in more detail, not only of the Jews leaving Babylon and not only of the gospel preacher, but it's also a prophecy concerning John the Baptist, preparing the way for the Lord as Isaiah deals with in numerous places here. But this is applicable to the preacher and the people listening to the preacher and the people under the sound of the gospel. And that's how I want to bring it out tonight. So I want you to note three things with me, please. And I'll outline them now as I do, and then you can listen out for them later. But number one, the beauty of the evangelist. Number two, the beauty of the exhortation. And number three, the beauty of the edict. So number one, look at the verse seven with me. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Number one, the beauty of the evangelist. Now this may sound like a very strange thing. You may look at this preacher and go, well, there ain't no beauty in that evangelist. I don't know. But that's not what the verse is saying here. When it says how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, there's a reason why the evangelist in our text is known as beautiful, because it's his Christ-likeness. It's his likeness unto Jesus. It's the, the fact that if an evangelist is doing his part and playing his role and preaching the Scriptures, you ought to see and hear Christ out of that man. Now, it's very interesting. When we look at the uh, specific detail here in the verse 7, it says concerning the mountains... How beautiful upon the mountains. Now this indicates to us that the evangelist has gone somewhere. The evangelist has climbed a great mountain. The evangelist has had to do something. And there's the first part to a beautiful thing about the evangelist, that, that there is a desire within a soul to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is a man that has evidently not just done an easy thing. He's not in the valley. He's not on the plain, but he's upon the mountains. He's gone that bit extra. He's gone the second mile. He's gone into all the world to preach the gospel. He's fulfilling the Great Commission. That's the first beautiful thing about the evangelist. But then it notes something in particular, the feet of the evangelist. Look what it says in the verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. 
Now you may say, well, that, that sounds strange. Well, what's that about? Why the feet in particular? Well, here we have a picture concerning biblical times when a king would have a messenger and the king would have a message and he would write it down or at times he would give it verbally to the messenger and the messenger would take off his shoes and he would begin to run. And he would run from the king's palace and he would go to wherever he's commanded to go. It might be another land. It might be another king he's speaking to. It might be to the people within his own country. But the, the messenger would do something. He would remove his shoes. He would take it off. And for speed and to get the message out as quickly as possible, the messenger would start to run. And naturally, as the messenger began to run with the king's message, his feet would be bruised and his feet would be cut and his feet would be dirtied as he ran across the, the, maybe the cobbled ro roads of Rome or maybe the dirt tracks of, of Israel. As he, as he ran, he would have had these bloodied and bruised feet. Why are the feet of the evangelist so beautiful? Read it again. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. I submit to you, friend, that the beautiful feet of the evangelist, they're beautiful because they remind us of the feet of Christ. They remind us of his bruised and soiled feet. They remind us of his bloodied feet. As he did what? As he came as the messenger of the Father. As re he, he revealed the way of salvation unto us. As he gave us the word of God and gave us the plan of redemption, he came with bruised and bloodied and nail-pierced feet. Friend, that's why the feet of him that bringeth good tidings are beautiful, because it reminds us of the feet of Christ. Now, all of this, all of this, it's all a picture of Christ. I want you to note that the, the beauty is in the picture of the blood. Now, this morning we dealt with the blood. We're, we're justified by His blood. We're redeemed through His blood. We, we read that, that we, are, we are cleansed with the blood of His Son, the blood of Jesus Christ, and, and cleanseth us from all sin. It's the blood that is important. It's the blood that we need to get a hold of. It's the blood that deals with our sin. It's the blood that is powerful. And not just any blood, it's the blood of the God-man. That's why this picture of bloodied feet are, are a beautiful thing. The, the picture of this beauty, it's, it's beautiful because of the picture of the blood of Christ. But come with me to Song of Solomon chapter 5, please. Song of Solomon chapter 5. I want you to note that the Christ is beautiful. In fact, the Scriptures tell us Christ is altogether lovely. And when the messenger is preaching Christ, when the messenger is being a separated individual, when the messenger is endeavoring to be Christ-like himself, when the messenger is bearing the king's seal and the king's authority, when the messenger is going forth as an ambassador of Christ, look who Christ is for a moment. Song of Solomon chapter 5 and the verse 9. We are asked a question in the verse 9. I want you to get a hold of something. And if you, you forget everything else I say, you remember this, my friend, that Christ is wonderful. Christ is beautiful. Christ is the one which our heart desires after. And it says in Song of Solomon 5 and the verse 9, What is thy beloved more than another beloved? Why is Christ so wonderful? Why is Christ any different? Why is Christ... A, a, a beloved one. Why should I look and search for and seek out your beloved? It says in the verse 9, What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? What is different about Christ? Look at the verse 10. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest, the chiefest among 10,000. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of water, washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are, are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands, 
His hands are his gold rings set with the beryl. His belly is his bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are his pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet. And look at this, the combination of everything that is wonderful and beautiful about Christ. Remember it, friend. Yea, he is altogether lovely. He's altogether lovely. There's nothing, nothing unlovely about Christ. He is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. And this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. You see, as we come back to our text, the evangelist has beautiful feet because it's a picture of the bloodied feet of Christ. But I believe that there is, there is a beauty in the evangelist because he is to be Christ-like. Look at the verse 14 with me, please, of Isaiah 52. And when we think of the beauty of Christ, when we think of who he is and what he is, and then the verse 14, a prophecy of Christ and, and a, pro, a, a prophecy of what is going to happen at Calvary. It says, as many were astonished at the, his visage, his face, the beautiful face of Christ. The face that we have just read about in Song of Solomon 5 with, with the perfect eyes and the perfect complexion and the wonderful cheeks and the beautiful lips and the, the lovely flock, uh, flowing hair and, uh, and the sweet things that come out of his mouth and, and the wonderful countenance. What does it say in the verse 14? That his visage was so marked more than any man. A picture of the cross. A picture of the fact that a Calvary who would so be beaten and bloodied and abused that you wouldn't even recognize him. How sad it is when we think of all that Christ had to do and yet how wonderful the, the cost he was willing to pay. But then there's not only a beauty in the picture of blood and a beauty in Christ himself and and this should be seen not only in the evangelist, but by every child of God. But there's also a beauty in the message of Christ. Because look what it says in the verse 7, that bringeth good tidings. You see that there's no wrath. The, the, the Lord and the scriptures rightly tell us for the wages of sin is death. But, but from the lips of Christ, there is mercy. There is grace. There is Good tidings. And friend, let me tell you this. This evangelist today, my job is to tell you about Christ, to tell you of his beauty, to tell you that he's the altogether lovely one, and to tell you that there's nobody quite like the Lord, and the Lord stands, even in money slain tonight, with arms wide open, ready to take you, ready to accept you, and to your heart in money slain, he brings good tidings. He brings good tidings to your soul. Come with me to Romans chapter 10, please. Romans chapter 10. And we find here where Isaiah is quoted. And we know that the message that we are about to explore in our text, it's referring to the gospel. Because the apostle Paul picks up on this and preaches a sermon on it himself. In Romans chapter 10 and the verses 13, 14, and 15. Because look what it says. If you found the place, it says Romans 10 verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, let's just stop there, friend. Whosoever, that's you tonight. If you're not yet saved, then call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. And the verse 14, it says, How then shall they call on him in, who, in whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So there's a call going out. We need evangelists. We need the messengers. We need the beautiful feet standing upon the mountain, bringing good tidings. It's talking about the preacher, and it's talking about the sermon, and it's talking about the gospel of Christ. And it says in the verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written... 
A quotation now from what we are reading in Isaiah. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. That is a direct quotation from Isaiah 52. And we find here that there is a beauty in the picture of the feet being bloodied. There is a picture of the evangelist, how he ought to be Christ-like, for he is an ambassador of the king, as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 tells us that we are ambassadors of Christ. But then we find that there's a beauty in the message. It's all about Christ. And this beauty should be seen in the evangelist. But then secondly, we see the beauty of the exhortation. The beauty of the exhortation. Look at the verse 7 of Isaiah 52. It says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Now look at this. That publisheth peace. That bringeth good tidings of good. (laughs) Now you couldn't really describe salvation in a better way, could you? Just in case you didn't know it was good tidings, the Scriptures gives us an extra word, an extra description, the same description, and says good tidings of good. Just in case you didn't believe it the first time, the Lord repeats it and says, it's most definitely good. We find not only peace is published and good tidings of good, but it says that publisheth salvation. This is what the evangelist is to preach. This is what the minister ought to preach. This is what the the beautiful feet are, are running to proclaim. This is the king's message to your soul. That there is peace, that there is good tidings, and there is salvation in Christ. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful? Come back with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And the verse 16 this time. And you say, well, Daniel, are you sure they're talking about the gospel in in Isaiah? Well, we already find in in Romans 10 verse 13, the call goes out to the whosoever. In the verse 14, there's a call going out. Preachers are required to proclaim the message. In the verse 15, Isaiah is quoted with the background, the preachers, gospel evangelists are required. And then the verse 16 of that same chapter, Romans 10, tells us, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. So we know that Isaiah is talking about the gospel. We know that when I preach tonight, the good things, the peace, the good tidings of good, the the publishing of salvation, it's talking about the cross. It's talking about Calvary. It's talking about all that Christ has accomplished. Come with me if you're still holding your place in Romans to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 and the verse 10. You know, something we don't like to see, but we were looking at this uh, this morning, we, we do find in the Scriptures that while we are not listening to the message, and if you're in that condition tonight, and you're not obeying the message, and not finding Christ, and maybe you have no time to accept His gospel as yet, and you find yourself too busy for God in your soul, for you'd rather have your sin and the pleasures thereof, well, it says in Romans 5 verse 10, when we were enemies... You're an enemy of God, friend. If you're in your sin, you're an enemy of God. Now, you may not like that, and you may say, Preacher, I go to church every Sunday. You may say, Preacher, I have a Bible. You may say, Preacher, I know the hymns, and I sing them with with the best of my ability every time I'm in a meeting. You may say, well, preacher, I put money in the offering. Preacher, I even try and invite people to come to church. Preacher, I live a clean life. Preacher, I do all sorts of good things and I, my neighbor. How can you say with such a reformed, clean living life, such as mine, that I could ever be an enemy of God? I tell you, while you're still in your sin, you're an enemy of God. And that's what the preacher brings to your heart today in Isaiah 52 verse 7, that there is a way of peace. There is a way of peace with God, friend. While you stay in your sin, you are heading for wrath, you are heading for condemnation, you are heading for hell. But there's an option of peace. There's a way to life. There's a road to heaven. And the way of peace is Christ. Look what it says in the verse 7 again. It says, if you look there with me, please, 
It says not only peace is published, but, but good tidings of good. Now, that really is a lovely phrase. But it's referring to exactly the same thing that we've already read in the verse. It says that the preacher is to bring good tidings. That's Christ. And just in case we doubt it, he says it again, not only bringeth good tidings, but says it again, that bringeth good tidings, and then says it a third time, good tidings of good. I want to tell you, there's not a better message than that of Christ. It is good tidings, and it is good tidings of good. Friend, you will not hear a better message than that of Christ. The world will try and convince you that there are pleasures out there, and I'm not going to deny that. There are pleasures in the world, but it's the pleasures of sin for a season. They'll not last. And you can drink yourself away all night long, and you'll wake up in the morning with a hangover. You can take all the drugs you like all night long, and you'll wake up in a sorry state in the morning if you wake up at all. Friend, the pleasures of sin, they're for a season. A season. But with Christ, He is good, and it is good tidings, and it is good tidings of good. It never ends. It never ends. The goodness never ends. The pleasure never ends. The joy never ends. It is always good. There's no caveat with this. But then look at the next bit. It says, the publisheth salvation. Friend, there is hope in Jesus Christ. There is hope in Jesus Christ. The word salvation clearly indicates you need to be saved Therefore, indicating that you're in danger. If you're an enemy of God, if you're in your sin, if you're heading for hell, if you're heading for wrath, friend, you're in danger. You're in danger of condemnation. You're in danger of falling foul of the wrath of God. And I ask, why? Why, when you know there's an option of peace? Why, when you know there's good tidings? Why, when you know there's good tidings of good? And why, when you know there's a way of salvation, why would you reject that? You see, we've already touched on it a little with the feet of the preacher and the feet of Christ. But I tell you this in more detail. Christ left heaven's glory and he did it for you. In this month of December, we find the Christmas lights and the trees going up already. And all the rest. What's it all about? It's not about presents and it's not about trees and it's not about lights. And it's not about any of that. It's about Christ. It's about the fact that he came. And why did he come? He came for you. And why did he live? He lived for you. Why did he die? He died for you. He shed his blood so that we could go free. And he went to the tomb for you. And praise God, he rose from the dead for you. And he stands in the glory now praying for you. This is the salvation that is offered to you. And I ask, why would you reject it? I quoted it this morning. It's written on the, one of the walls in the church hall. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? If you don't want Christ, if you don't want to accept the way that the blood makes, if you don't want to accept Calvary, you don't want to accept the fact that you need to repent and believe the gospel. You say, is there any way of escape? No, there isn't, friend. There's no escape. There's only one way. The children sang it on Tuesday evening. One way, God said, to get to heaven. Jesus is the only way. It doesn't get any more complicated than that, and it can't be any simpler than that. The way of salvation. But then last of all, and very quickly... Not only the beauty of the evangelist, Christ's likeness, the beauty of the exhortation, good tidings, peace, salvation. But then thirdly, the beauty of the edict. Now what's an edict? An edict is an official proclamation. <laughs> an official proclamation. We hear a lot of that nowadays, don't we? Uh, government says that. Monarch says that. Well, whatever. We hear official proclamations quite a lot, really. In a country, well, here in our verse, we, we find an edict. But this time, it's one worth listening to. And it says, look at it at the end of the verse. That saith unto Zion, saith unto the Jews at their time, but also saith to the church, Thy 
God reigneth. Friend, that ought to thrill your soul, you know. You see, the evangelist comes and preaches and preaches and preaches the good tidings and the peace and the good tidings of good and the salvation. But also there is that truth that ought to lighten the heart of God's people, but also bring trepidation to the sinner's soul that thy God reigneth. No one else reigns, but Jehovah is seated upon the throne. Jehovah. Come with me to Psalm 47, if you would. Psalm 47 and the verse 8. Psalm 47 and the verse 8. And look what it says here. I don't want you to forget this. I know we can get down in the dumps at times, and, and rightly so. We see wickedness on every hand. We see the world going about what the world does. We seem to see a, a degradation in things that are holy and moral and biblical. Every single day we switch on the news. But I want you to remember this, child of God that God hasn't abdicated the throne. He's still in control. He's still in charge. And it says in Psalm 47, look at the verses 7 and 8, For God is the King of all the earth. Isn't that wonderful? It ain't Boris Johnson, by the way. It isn't any politician. It isn't any earthly monarch. Look what it says. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. And look at this now, verse 8. God reigneth over the heathen, even those that defy him, even those that reject him, even those that have no time for him, even those that blaspheme him and usurp him, and even those that say, no God for me, as they shake their puny fist at him. Well, he reigns over them too. For God reigns over the heathen, and it says in the verse 8, God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. Thy God reigneth. Come with me to John chapter 15, verse 19, please, because I, I'm conscious that we do feel this. I feel this. I'm sure I'm no extraordinary case. I believe all of God's people feel this. We feel there's a growing darkness upon the face of the earth. We, we feel that that in that sense, a time is coming when, when the Lord could soon approach. We feel we're coming into those last days where there's continual evil. And it says in John chapter 15, and look at the verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. And it does, doesn't it? The world does love its own. The world does love evil. But it says in the verse 19, but because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out to the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. <laughs> the world will hate you. So don't try and be loved by the world, for the world hates you, friend. But then come back with me to Psalm 97 this time. Psalm 97. You see, this is what I want you heartened by. It doesn't matter what the world thinks. Because God is on the throne. God is king of all the earth. God is reigning over the heathen. God is reigning over the church. God is still sovereign over all, no matter what men may do. And it says in Psalm 97 and the verse 1, look at it now. The Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. You see, when we look at our verse, and you say, well, well, what's this got to do with the gospel? What's this got to do with the gospel meeting? What's this got to do with, with the proclamation of Isaiah 52 and the verse 7? We've looked at, at the beauty of the evangelist is found in, in the fact that he's meant to be a picture of Christ bearing Christ's message. We find that the, there's a beauty in the exhortation because it's bringing peace, it's bringing good things, it's, it's bringing salvation, how we can get right with Christ. But you say, what is the beauty of the edict the beauty of the edict is this, that it is the final nail in the gospel appeal, bringing us to Christ. Because sinners all too often are forgetting that thy God reigneth. One last reference, Hebrews, please. Hebrews chapter 9 and the verse 27, but this is a verse you all know well. Because that truth that God reigneth is not just an encouragement to the Christian, but it's a fearful thing for the sinner. It is a thing of trepidation 
for those that have been defying the king, defying the king's ambassadors, defying the king's edicts, defying his rule and his authority. I want to tell you, because God reigneth, we all will stand before him one day, and he will be our great judge. And in this life, we need to listen to his evangelists preach of his Christ, because we're going to be asked about it one day. And it says in Hebrews 9, verse 27, it is appointed unto men once to die. We may not like that, but that's what's going to happen. It is appointed unto men once to die, but that's not it. I was doing a bit of evangelism in the past week, speaking to a man, and he, he said, I don't like to think about death, don't like to talk about death. I said, forget about death for a moment. Think about what's happening after death. Because look what it says in the verse 27. It is appointed unto men once to die, comma, there's more. But after this, the judgment. You see, when the messenger comes and tells you, thy God reigneth, that means you've got to stand before him. That means you've got to give an account to him. That means your sin will be dealt with by the king. And I ask, as the messenger comes to your heart in Monish Lane Free Presbyterian Church tonight, and as a messenger comes and tells you of the good things that are in Christ, and the peace that is in Christ, and the good things of good that are in Christ, and the salvation that is in Christ. As the warning comes to your soul that God reigneth, I ask you, what think ye of Christ? Will you reject him? Will you turn away? Will you trample upon the free gift of his shed blood? Or will you accept him tonight? Will you get right with him? Will you be ready to meet the Lord? How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Let's bow in a word of prayer together, please. And as every head is bowed, as every eye is closed, I don't know who's listening tonight. Maybe there's some in the church and not yet right with God. Maybe there's someone in the hall or in the car park not yet right with God. Friend, I plead with you, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Will you not get right with him now? Will you not deal with your sin before him? Will you not repent and believe the gospel? If you have any questions, speak with me. I'd be more than happy to point you to Christ. But friend, don't leave without the Savior tonight. Heavenly Father, bless thy word to every heart. Save souls, we plead. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.